This is Fact and Science Fiction, the podcast about the science behind the themes and tropes in science fiction. I'm your host, Carly, and this episode is about the flu and Stephen King's The Stand. And this episode is about the flu in Stephen King's The Stand. There have been several pandemics that have stricken the human population. Cholera, the Black Plague, HIV AIDS, the Spanish Influenza, the flu, SARS, bird flu, swine flu, Ebola, and tuberculosis, just to name a few of them. How do these pandemics spread? What do they actually do to the human body? And where do these diseases come from? Specifically, I wanted to focus on the flu in Stephen King's The Stand. In The Stand, a government experiment into highly contagious disease is unleashed upon America when a soldier is exposed and instead of allowing himself And instead of allowing himself to be quarantined, he leaves the base with his family, infecting everyone he comes across. The book charts the three weeks it takes for the disease, called the superflu or Captain Trips or the Trips, to spread all across the world. It starts out as a head cold, sneezing and coughing and fatigue, but those infected think it's just a spring cold at first. But then people start getting fevers and thick phlegm. Then the virus goes away for a day or two, so people think they're getting better and they leave their house. Then the superflu strikes even harder and the patients die from choking on this thick black mucus coming out of their mouth and nose. Or they die delirious from the fever. In this section in the stand, a doctor called Dietz says, So where are we tonight? We've got a disease that's got several well-defined stages, but some people may skip a stage. Some people may backtrack a stage. Some people may do both. Some people stay in one stage for a relatively long time, and others zoom through all four as if they were on a rocket sled. This scares me, Starkey. It scares me because nobody but a smart doctor with all the facts is going to be able to diagnose anything but a common cold in the people who are out there carrying this. Christ, nobody goes to the doctor anymore unless they've got pneumonia or a suspicious lump or a bad case of the dancing hives. Too hard to get one to look at you. So they're going to stay home, drink fluids, and get plenty of bed rest, and then they're going to die. Before they do, they're going to infect everyone who comes into the same room with them. And so far, no one who's come down with it has gotten better. So that is the fictional fictional virus, the super flu in the stand. It's also described as a combination of pneumonia, of mono, of the flu, and cold all wrapped up into one with a little bit of the Black Plague because it's very communicable. So I wanted to look into the actual flu, you know, that comes around seasonally and gets everybody at work sick. And uh, there's a controversy now about getting your flu shot, at least in my old workplace. So I looked into the misconceptions of the flu. And I also talked to Jess, who is a ICU nurse, and so she had seen a lot of um, myths and misconceptions about the flu when she started nursing, and I picked her brain about what people think about the flu. That's actually incorrect. So one biggest misconception about the flu is that it's not dangerous. And the reason people think that it's not dangerous is because they don't actually know what the flu is. People get colds in the springtime or they get a seasonal cold, they get over it in a couple days, and they're like, oh, I just had the flu. But if you get over it in a few days, then it is not the flu. People can actually die from the flu, and they do. Even with antiviral therapy, it will take 7 to 10 days to get over the flu. Um, Antiviral therapy uh, is commonly known as Tamiflu, but there are more drugs uh, going on the market. You need to get Tamiflu within the first 48 hours of symptom onset for it to be the most effective, which is unfortunate because uh, if a lot of people, if so many people think that a, that the flu is actually the cold or a cold is actually a flu, if they don't really understand what's happening to them, then it's really hard for people to actually see the doctor within that 48 hours. Misconception number two, there is no stomach flu. Influenza does not affect your stomach. People might experience nausea from coughing too much or from feeling sick, but it is not a stomach virus. Misconception 1A, uh, kind of related to people thinking that a flu is actually just a cold, 
I will dive a little bit deeper into what uh, separates a cold from the flu. So a cold, like a head cold or a chest cold, tends to come on gradually. You might start off with a sniffly nose and then a cough and then get congestion. And then um, you start to feel really run down and fatigued. The flu, on the other hand, hits you like a train. You feel fine one day and the next you feel terrible. That's what made the stand so scary is that people would go through their days coughing and sneezing and thinking they were just suffering from a light head cold. But as they were going throughout their day, they were infecting everyone they had come across. And then a week later, they were dead. So I want to read another passage from the stand that that horrifyingly um, describes how communicable or how contagious the super flu in the stand is. So here's how it starts. Chain letters don't work. It's a known fact. A million dollars or so you are promised if you'll just send one single dollar to the name at the top of the list and add yours to the bottom, and then send the letter on to five friends, never arrives. This one, the Captain Tripp's chain letter, worked very well. The pyramid was indeed being built, not from the bottom up, but from the tip down, said Tip being a deceased army security guard named Charles Campion. All the chickens were coming home to roost. Only instead of the mailman bringing each participant bale after bale of letters, each containing a single dollar bill, Captain Tripps brought bales of bedrooms with a body or two in each one, in trenches, and dead pits, and finally bodies slung up into the oceans on each coast, and into quarries and into the foundations of unfinished houses. And in the end, of course, the bodies would rot where they fell. Sarah Bradford and Angela Dupre walked back to their parked cars together, then pecked cheeks and went their separate ways. Sarah went home to infect her husband and his five poker buddies and her teenage daughter, Samantha. The next day, Samantha would go on to infect everybody in the swimming pool at the Poliston YMCA, and so on. A cold, like a real head cold, rarely has body aches, while body aches and fever are the hallmark symptoms of the flu. Chest discomfort and pain and headaches are more common with the flu than the cold. And then, a sore throat or sneezing are more typically found in cold symptoms. Just keep this in mind. The bug that causes a cold is called rhinovirus, and rhino is Latin for nose. If you're feeling uh, sinus congestion and, and a sore throat and you're sneezing, you most likely have just a head cold. But if it's coupled with like body aches and you feel like Jess describes hammered dog shit, then it's most likely the flu and you should go see a doctor. So when she told me that the bug that causes a cold is called rhinovirus, um, I wanted to know more about the uh, virus influenza. Orthomyxovirus is the family of viruses and the genus is influenza. And then there can be multiple types of that genus, such as A and B, affect humans and subtype C only affects ticks. It mutates incredibly quickly, normal, normally not more than annually, but treating the flu is an ongoing thing. The different strains of virus have different genetic codes with changes on these two proteins, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase protein. And then they can identify which mutation on those two proteins and then label them as such, such as the H1N1 flu. The H and N stand for those proteins. And then it goes from like H1N2, H2N1, and so on. The flu is transmitted through droplets, so if you catch it, it's because you have someone else's spit in you. So if you do think you have the flu, you should wear a mask when you go outside. And if you refuse to get your flu shot, you should also wear a mask. So droplet range is about 3 feet, and people can sneeze as far as 20 feet, but uh, as far as medical professionals uh, think, consider, 3 feet is the contagious range. So what happens when you uh, like inhale a droplet? Well, inside that droplet are little molecules of the virus. The virus will infect a cell basically on around the molecule of the virus are these little these little extensions and those extensions are like keys all around it and it will um, when it goes into the body and it lands on a cell, those keys will match with like a lock that we have in the cell and a cell will be like, oh, hey, I recognize you and we'll bring it in. When a virus infects a cell, it goes through its replication, you know, like you learned in biology class, it'll split and multiply. 
And as it multiplies, um, it'll ex create more and more of them. And then it will shred the viruses out of the cell. So basically it will burst the cell and all of these copies, millions of them, will come out of the cell. This takes about six hours to do. And six hour replication is very short. So the flu is fast moving. It mutates quickly and reproduces quickly and that's why it hits people so fast and hard. And just so you know, the flu vaccine, the flu shot, is not a live virus. It's basically a giving your body a heads up. It tells your immune system, hey, this is what the flu virus looks like, so don't just accept it into your cell body and let it replicate inside you. So your immune system will keep an eye out for that kind of, kind of invader and fight it off. As you may have heard, the flu virus is dangerous to the young and old, but it's also dangerous to people in their 20s to 40s because this age group does not go to the doctor. Um, they wait so long to seek treatment, and by the time that they go see a doctor, they are very close to death. Jess has had patients as young as 35 die from the flu, and they were otherwise healthy because uh, before the flu. Even though that the flu is dangerous to younger and older people, older people are more cautious and they are more likely to, to go to the doctor. And then young children are more likely to be taken into the doctor uh, when they have a fever by their parents. So it's really the folks in their 20s through, 30, through 40s that wait until they are hours from death before they go see a doctor. So how does the flu actually kill people? So people die from the flu because it causes a... a whole body infection. As these cell, as our cells burst to release all of these copies of the flu virus, um, everything inside of our cells are now splooted outside into our body and fluids start leaking where they shouldn't. That fluid irritates other cells and our body doesn't really know how to handle that, so it just becomes an, a total inflammatory response. Blood pressure drops and patients get SIRS or SIRS, and SIRS stands for Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. And then that SIRS can turn into sepsis. Patients can end up with what's called ARDS. Sorry, there's a lot of medical acronyms. ARDS, I think is how it's pronounced. When fluids collect in the air sacs in the lungs. It's not like a fluid is sitting in your lungs, but all the vessels and capillaries in the lungs are leaking due to those shredded cells. And as it's leaking, your lungs are becoming more rigid because your capillaries and vessels aren't working as, as they should. Once it progresses to ARDS or sepsis, the flu can lead to a very high mortality rate. So if you have the flu and it's difficult and painful to breathe, that is a medical emergency and you should go to the ER. I asked just if the stand depicts like the kind of death from the flu accurately. And she says it depicts an engineered flu realistically. The way it mutated so quickly in people, it felt like it had a third protein base beside the, besides the H and the N that could help it get into cells even faster. So it would have more keys all over the molecule that could unlock, you know, the cell barrier and get inside. And it seemed the super flu in the, sand, in the stand seemed to reproduce even faster than the real flu. The way it spread and the way they tried to contain it was pretty realistic. But the super flu had symptomatology that didn't fit the flu as we know it. While people lymph nodes may swell on the flu, their entire neck doesn't swell and become rigid like it does in the book. The stand super flu looked like it caused a glandular fever like mono does. It's like a combination of the flu, mono, and black plague, and Stephen King made it mutate faster than it actually does. It seemed to have a very short incubation period from when people get it and when people start developing symptoms and start infecting other people. But just said the way it killed people was pretty spot on. Stephen King in particular is well known for, um, for researching the science behind his books. When I read Pet Cemetery, he was very detailed about the funeral business. And so we weren't surprised that the 
uh, medicine in the stand was very accurate. And I just want to say, technically the stand counts as science fiction, science fiction horror, because it was written in the 1970s, but it's set in the 1990s. So even though that's the past, it's really set in the future. And doesn't the stand deal with the same themes as science fiction? Disaster strikes, heroes rise, there's a battle between good and evil. There are also some supernatural parts, but for the purpose of this episode, the stand is science fiction horror. I do want to have, do want to put in a little disclaimer, like all Stephen King books, this is my third one I'm reading. As far as like the language and the references used, it's a little outdated, a little tone deaf. Uh, I get a little frustrated, especially with the stand, because it's like, it's his imagination of what the future would be like, and people still say the N-word all the time. It was frustrating. Um, also, we're reading it out loud to each other, so it makes it a little, un- makes it definitely uncomfortable and also kind of awkward skipping over all of these slurs. So that wraps up this episode. I want to thank everybody who tuned in to um, the Live Planet Comic Con episode, and I want to shout out uh, my patrons on Patreon. Uh, they will be receiving the full length episode of my of my live panel at Klexicon. A lot of the content is the same um, from the Planet Comic Con one, but there's a little bit extra stuff sprinkled in. This podcast was brought to you by Audible.com. Audible is the place for audiobooks. And I recommend The Calculating Stars by Mary Robinette Kowal. It is an alternate history about the first woman astronaut So if you want to download this book or another of your choosing, go to audibletrial.com slash fact and sci-fi. That's audibletrial.com slash fact and sci-fi. Subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, wherever you get this podcast. Oh, and follow the podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at fact and sci-fi. And lastly, thanks for listening.